So good evening. Hope that you all had a nourishing day. That's what we're here to do, to take care of ourselves and each other. So as you're kind of probably getting the flavor of this time together, we're really looking at contemplative care in a very broad way, from shadows and unconscious biases to integrative approaches to nutrition through our personal stories, our clinical stories. And so this is one of the reasons why we have a great pleasure of tonight hearing from Rita Sharon, who offers her wonderful perspective. Please welcome her. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming back to this room to sit for another hour. Uh, it's been a very full day. Um, I feel very grateful to be chimed to a podium, um, and I'll try to be equal to that. Uh, it's been a very full day. It's been a um, very demanding day for us all. Um, um, we've been in the presence of thought and ideas and practices and mortality. We've been in the presence of it all, even perhaps more than we typically are at work. Um, uh, and I'm, um, we're never very far away from knowing that we are human and we have bodies and we are mortal and we will die. Uh, oddly, the work that you see on the slide um, helps me in that um, contemplation. Uh, this is a Rothko. This is a painting by Mark Rothko. It's number 16. When he became an abstract expressionist, he stopped giving titles to his paintings. He just gave numbers. This is number 16. It's in room 922 of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, you can go visit it if you're in town. And the museum guards are pretty good at letting you just sit on the floor in front of the Rothko for 45 minutes and lean against the wall and look at it. They bother you, okay, lady, are you all right? <laughs> um, but um, uh, 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 for many reasons, uh, we're, we're kind of under his spell. And if you do nothing but gaze at my Rothkos, there'll be more. If you do nothing but gaze at my Rothkos and be summoned into them, I will have, you will be joining me in what I'm hoping to do. Um, um, I just want you to know that, that Rothko um, uh, was a man of suffering. He came from, he came from Russia, Marcus Rothkowitz. Um, and was never successful as an artist. Uh, it was too early in the century for Jews to be fully accepted in this country. So he had a very hard time in Yale and in New York and died, took his life 10 years after he painted this painting, uh, not knowing that he would have such power with the beauty of his work. Um, not power over, but power for his spectators. So, um, and, and I want you to gaze at it. I, I, I um, achieved the compromise of the persons in charge of light and video by asking them to keep the lights as low as they could so that you can see the Rothkos. And as you gaze at this one, the red will slowly start to mix and bleed into the blue. And that brown at the bottom will slowly become not just brown, but like fertile, earthy soil. The paintings will do things. So please keep your eye on them uh, through the next half hour. 
Uh, but what I'm asking for now is your help in thinking about the care of the sick as a creative act. Ruth is a writer, editor, thanatologist, sharp-featured seer. She's been a patient of mine uh, for about 30 years. Um, she's a very short woman. She's barely five foot tall. Um, she has very sharp features. If you think of Margaret Hamilton in Wizard of Oz, do you remember? She looks like her. <laughs> and Ruth is a very cranky, uh, decisive, sharp-tongued woman. So I was her internist, and she smoked a pack a day. She would never stop. She drank more scotch than was good for her, and she would never stop. And she didn't have time for mammograms and flu shots and colonoscopies. And I learned early on as her internist that there was no way that there was going to be any way but hers. <laughs> it was her daughter, a colleague of mine, who asked me to be her mother's doctor. And I speak of Ruth now because she is a thanatologist, a gravestone rubber, a, um, I mean, she was a thanatologist before Kubler-Ross. So I found myself writing about Ruth, as I write about many patients, in order to understand things about them. Um, I write to learn what I know. And so I found myself writing about Ruth as she got iller, iller, more ill. Um, and then I showed Ruth what I had written about her and her daughter. And they let me publish what I had written about her in some essay I was writing at the time. And I just want to read you a little piece of that. Some years ago, I began to suspect that Ruth's cognitive powers were in decline. Eventually, she became able herself to recognize her slowly deepening memory loss even though she'd get angry with me when I probed this area of her health. I had her see a neurologist who specializes in dementia. When I asked what the specialist told her, she said, Dr. Carlson thinks I have Alzheimer's, but I don't. She looked long and hard at me, and during that stare, I realized and accepted my duty toward her. It is, it is to wait with her on her precipice while the dementia comes toward us. I will watch with her, not knowing if my being there with her will alter her weight. On her next visit, she brings a copy of a manuscript she's currently writing. It included the poem, The New Colossus, by Emma Lazarus, of course, uh, of the Statue of Liberty. And this poem was the dedication for this work she was writing. It included these lines. Not like the giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman. So I got the message. Here stands a mighty woman. So as we look at my Rothko, what happens? What is summoned in you as the spectator? I hope you're looking at it and feeling a sense, certainly after all we did today, of attention, of awareness, of availability. The French call it disponibilité. I don't know why that sounds so much more powerful than availability. Uh, Leo Stein, brother of Gertrude, the art collector, uh, in Paris, uh, he says, no work of art exists without a spectator. So it is we, it is we who lend ourselves to the artist and to the work, and it is a lending in transport. Uh, we hope without fear. It's kind of both a surrender and an engagement and very dicey union in which we are carried away. Uh, it is a state of beholding, 
What you are doing sitting here is, is beholding. And of course, you'll behold it even better when you sit on the floor in room 922. I think that these states of beholding are learned best or uh, most quickly in responding to works of art. I know that I've learned my states of beholding from Rothko, from Henry James, from Bach, from Fred Hurst, the jazz pianist, uh, uh, from, from the works of great beauty, whichever they are for you. We know that the spectator completes the work, that the work is developed within the dark room of the self. This is where the images arise. If you're old enough, you remember the Dectal bath in the dark room. And it, is, it, it arises from the chemicals of our own memories, our dreams, our talents, our fears, our creativity, that which is within ourselves, are what activate the work. Artists are very lucky to have us. Henry James is very lucky to have me. He knows that. <laughs> Bach is lucky to have Glenn Gould. Now, Rothko died without knowing how lucky he was. Hmm? What else happens to the spectator? We behold, we complete the work, and in the process of responding, we ourselves are formed. We become self, I'm repeating what Michael said this morning, we become self, whatever that means, by virtue of our engagement with works of art that we, in effect, midwife. We're summoned out of our ordinary selves by the work, by what the work tells. We're summoned toward other, I think, fuller or more surprising selves. I would not be me without James and Rothko and Bach. And I propose that the same summoning occurs in the presence of patience. Ruth's family invites me to pass over Seder at their home. By now, Ruth has indeed become deeply demented. Still, by all means herself, with her sharp humor and her capacity for human connection, she lives in a different realm from the rest of us. She speaks, it sounds like human speech, it has the cadence of human speech, but it is not words, it is nonsense syllables, but it sounds like human speech. She will do this in my office, uh, uh, you know, at the clinic. And I delight in responding and repeating as best I can the sounds she made. And she gets it. And we go back and forth. And you would say it means nothing, but of course it means, it means everything. And we delight one another in this echoing of sounds that take their meaning from the speaker. That Passover Seder night, she requires constant attention. She rocks, she laughs to private thoughts, she walks very slowly. The devotion and the patience of her daughter and son-in-law are, are beyond me. They move me deeply, I've never seen anything like it. We are all responding to the artist within Ruth, that which creates her beauty. We are summoned by it disarmed, nourished, at its service, by virtue of it made more ourselves. Now, what happens to the artist or the creator in the process of making this work? Writers will say, typically, as a commonplace, I write to know what I think. Schumann, remember, dreams his music. He has dreams of the music. He gets up quick, writes it down. The angel came to me, gave me this music. James says in his writing, Henry, 
uh, in his writing, he's in communication with sources, which he italicizes, that his consciousness shines, quote, as from immersion in the fountain of being. Now, this is not just one guy in the village writing long sentences. <laughs> There's a peril, of course, to such vision. There's the burden of seeing what one is given to see. And I don't mean in a kind of romantic Victorian dorsum of hand to forehead, woe is me, I see. I don't mean that. I mean very, very concretely that it is costly to see. We read about Cezanne's doubt. We know Dostoevsky's underground. We've been through Kafka's metamorphosis. We, if we are brave enough to read all thousand pages, we become in on David Foster Wallace's what turned out to be his final jest. I'm not alluding to psychiatric conditions or uh, or that, I'm alluding to the existential response of having visions that are very, very hot to handle. I think this state of creativity exists for artists of all ranks, all ranks, all of us, as we write, as we paint, as we dance, as we play music, we are in a heightened state that is not always pleasurable that is self-questioning, that is solitary, that is tentative. It takes the entire novel of To the Lighthouse for Lily Briscoe, the artist, to finally say, I have found my vision. The dancer learns to dance and then lets his or her body do it. The potter finds the center, preserving the stillness as that wheel turns. The writer simply doesn't know before writing what will appear. It's another kind of surrender. The work finds its way to the artist seductively sometimes. The artist follows the work being led into it, led into the doubt and the uncertainty of that very state of creativity, that which is by definition a state of doubt. Rothko wrote a manifesto uh, that was found way after his death by his children, and they published it. Uh, it. It's published under the name The Artist's Reality. He's writing about the poet or the philosopher, and he says, quote, their chief preoccupation, like the artist, is the expression in concrete form of their notions of reality. Like him, like the artist, they deal with the verities of time and space, life and death, and the heights of exaltation and the depths of despair. This is the poet, the philosopher, the artist, written by the artist who then took his life. You can see, I don't have to read the next sentence, that this is what we do in clinical work this is what we do particularly in end-of-life work, that we deal with the verities of time and space, life and death, exaltation and despair. And you can see by now my proposition is that as we do this, we mm, cannot but be creative artists ourselves. That this is what by virtue of doing this work you have shown yourselves to be. On a Friday, Ruth's daughter texts me that her mother is listless, not eating, somnolent, sniffling. Her temperature's normal, her blood pressure's okay. There's no evidence of infection on the skin, in the urine, in the lungs. We treat with a mild decongestant for the head cold. Knowing that her family has decided against aggressive treatment and instead for palliative care, knowing how close Ruth has been to death for some months now, I endorse her daughter's choice of leaving B. There is to be no ambulance to the emergency room. 
I do not know what exactly has changed, but I know not to interfere in the process. This is the gray indeterminacy of uncertainty. Um, my hands were held out in front of me through the mist of doubt. I wasn't sure what was happening. Uh, my, my internist self will try to nail down what's what to banish the doubt. By contrast, I think the person who can tolerate doubt will use whatever creativity is at hand. And that person who can tolerate doubt will enter the fog of doubt, whatever that purple mist is outside those black windows appears to me like the fog of doubt. And we agree to go into it simply not to foreclose the doubt. Hmm? Now Rothko goes into the, into the doubt, into the mist, and comes back with bars of color. Bach goes into the doubt and comes back with partita number four. James goes into the doubt and comes back with wings of the dove. These are not solutions to the doubt. They are simply reports of what it's like. One of the, protagon the protagonist of one of James's short stories, The Middle Years, a doctor dying on his bedside says the words, I know, I'm sure you know them, they're probably the most often repeated words of James. The old man says as he dies, we work in the dark, we do what we can, we give what we have. Our doubt is our passion, our passion is our task, the rest is the madness of art. Hmm? I think the creativity renders doubt habitable you can tolerate doubt once it's been transformed into beauty. Perhaps this is what beauty is for, to console us for the doubt that engenders it. What I hope has been happening with you in the face of my Rothkos is that you travel through these black windows into the purple mist rather bravely because in the context of today, we all have a feeling of what those black windows are. But you know that the work did not exist until developed by your attention in that dark room of self. And it is that attention that animates and activates and develops them. In like manner, I've been animated by my patient Ruth Being her doctor ignites new vision within my own field of doubt. I have never seen this work of art. It is an unfolding creation. It is the self of another, now touchingly, shockingly, somehow exposed to me, entrusted into my doctorly hands. This is the precipice on which I embarked years ago at the time of her diagnosis. This is why she pinned me with her stare to see if I was up to accompanying her all the way. Oh. There. This is the celestial Rothko. Late Sunday evening, Ruth dies. Her daughter and son-in-law phone me. They describe her slow, calm, unlabored passing. I report the death to those who must know, sparing the family an in investigation by virtue of testifying as her doctor to the natural cause of her death 
so she didn't have to be an M.E. case hmm? and get brought to the city morgue. No, she didn't need to do that. The funeral home sends an emissary to my office the next day with the death certificate, which I sign in the required black ink. As I turn to mount the stairs after this momentous signature, by hazard, and also not by hazard, I meet at the stairwell the Zen Buddhist chaplain, my friend Segan, who's here, who you know, in front of whom immediately I break into tears, to whom I tell what I just did. He consoles me. He thanks me for my fidelity to my patient and her family, for having tolerated the doubt and gift of being mortal. So, so join me, please, in, in celebrating, or at least um, accepting <laughs> that, that, um, that the work we do, healthcare, is a form of beholding, and it's with these, I'm calling them spectator skills, but, but what I mean is the capacity to perceive, the capacity to behold, the capacity to, to appreciate that which is exposed to us in our work. With those capacities, we apprehend the creative force of every patient so that our work is not just kind of technical, but a, a profoundly creative practice that unites those who care with those we care for, that all of us, henceforth, all of us are transported and transformed toward, this is not a word I use lightly, truth and beauty by welcoming these mists of doubt, by having the nerve to be carried into those black windows, into the purple mist. And we're, we're, we're carried not only into the doubt, but into what we heard Dr. Lodog speaking of as the mysteries of life. Hmm? the precipice of being mortal, that befall and unite us all. So I propose, I propose that the care of the sick is a work of art and that we are all um, together in not just perceiving but creating beauty. Thank you.